Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to Political Punks. Let's welcome our guests. Joining us is Matt Palumbo, Lisa DiPasquale, Braxton McCoy, and Terry Shepard. And of course, I'm your host, Brett R. Smith, the humblest of all hosts. <laughs> so <laughs> let's talk about Hunter Biden. Um, so, so this week, Joe Biden was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and he was talking to, I don't know if he was talking to troops or if he was just talking to people giving a speech, but he was talking about how like the greatest threat to Western civilization in America is not ISIS, it's not Al Qaeda, it's white supremacy. Um, did everybody see this? It was, you know, and, th and then a couple of days later, he gave another speech where he talked about it was the greatest threat to Western civilization in America is global warming. So these things always shift. But, you know, we have the Hunter Biden text messages, which I don't know. Are these confirmed or are they just still a alleged? I think if you're writing about it, you you for legal purposes have to say alleged. But it's one of those things where it's like allegedly, but not but also really. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, and the world, you know, I was thinking of this. I keep still laughing about this, but it's like the world now knows what Hennessy rates are. You know, <laughs> you know, so I keep laughing. This this is obviously like these texts are like obviously some kind of inside joke between Hunter and his yeah. lawyer. And I also I noticed he only used the uh, the N word with the soft A. So I think he knew there's a chance <laughs> this would get read and God forbid it's not quite as bad. Right. Right. The soft A is acceptable. Uh, I mean, not music. really, but it's, it's, a le it's a leg down, apparently, in the hierarchy of uh, bed. So yeah. I think he, he planned ahead. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would yeah. agree with that. But it was obviously some kind of a joke. And he's talking about, hey, you know, hey, what are you charging me Hennessy rates for? And, yeah. you know, like, it's just this bizarre back and forth and the lawyers laughing. Um, but, you know, it just got me thinking. I'm just kind of like, you know, is, you know, is Hunter Biden an example of what Joe Biden calls the biggest threat to America? Is there... You know, is there legit white supremacy here, just given the climate in America? I mean, you can't say that word if you're white and get away with it. So so in reality, no. In the new world by the left's rules, yes. Um, because you know, people are getting canceled for making racist comments 45 years ago. So, you know, by their own rules, yeah, that, that counts now officially. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I, I still I, I still laugh about it. I think I still think it's funny. Um, the Hennessy rates, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of just, 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 it's just ridiculous. But at the same time, it's kind of like you know, if Eric Trump or Donald Trump Jr. got caught doing this with somebody like Stephen Miller or whomever, Rudy Giuliani, it'd just be. Well, um, it would actually get covered. It would get covered. Yeah, that was the other thing. I mean, nobody talked about this all week. Yeah, the new well, they're rules not going, they're still not going only to. apply to certain people, <laughs> even well, though. But, but but I was thinking about this. Um, I think we spend a lot of time. We all spend a lot of time. Uh, talking about the hypocrisy as if they give a shit. They don't. As if, as if pointing out how often they're hypocritical is going to stop them. It's not going to uh, stop them. It hasn't stopped them till now. And so I don't think Hunter Biden is a racist. I, I mean, I don't think, you know, I don't think mo the people that, th were, that are being called racist are not racist. I think that's just the language you use. And like you said, we know what would happen if someone else did it. If I did it or Braxton did it or someone else did it, it'd be, that'd be, that'd be curtains for us. Got, got it. That's the battlefield. So I think, I don't know. It's, it's, it cracks me up that I see a lot of, you know, other conservative writers too, the conservative incorporated that used to be sort of the voice of the conservative movement that are now been pushed to the outside. They, I mean, you could point the hypocrisy out all day. They don't give a shit because they don't have to give a shit because there is no, there's no repercussions for them doing it. So, I mean, so the only way to really beat them is not to point out how full of crap they are is to smash them, is to politically smash them, not physically smash them, but to politically defeat them. And, and because I feel like we've, we've, if you don't know by now the game and how it's rigged and who's the winners and who's the losers and who can do what, and who can't, then you haven't been paying attention for the last however many years. I'm just sort of over it because I just know, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't yeah. matter. It, 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 they're not going to stop and pointing out that they're full of crap. Do you think that's going to make them do any self-examination? No, not at all. There's no reason for them to. Well, I think you're right, but it goes, it goes beyond that. I, the hypocrisy is actually the point, you know, it's like sticking a finger in your eye. It's yeah. demoralize us. 
<laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They're trying to beat you down. Like you're already – it's putting a foot on your neck while you're already down. Same thing like with Kamala Harris not saying anything about Memorial Day or whatever that comment was that she made. Right. That's not a mistake. Happy long weekend. Yeah. She, that's, there's no chance that that got put out, you know, in error. That was intentional, and it's just another finger in your eye. Yeah, They're like, I think you're right. Yep. That wasn't like – that wasn't an oversight. That was a direct – F you because they knew it whip everybody up and there would be an inner that she'd be they'd be talking about her for a couple days and then she could lob the you don't like women or black people thing because that's what they do and and but yeah it's all intentional at this point because there's not going to be anything done about it <laughs> it's just not going to be it is what it is yeah. man you got to just take it yeah man they're just brazen at this point and i just see it as the the whole double standard thing is it, it, it's not that that's not a legit point, but we're be, but it's like you said, we're beyond that. This is now sort of uh, instigating and also just it's just in your face to demoralize us and to make us feel like shit. And then kind of yep. get to that point where we just say, well, fuck it. You know, I give up. I'm moving to Costa Rica. You know, they they, they would love nothing more than that for all of us just to, just to say, fuck it. You know, this place isn't worth it's not worth fighting for. It's not worth anything anymore because it's lost. Hunter Biden lied on a gun application. Mm -hmm. He then had his girlfriend or his wife or some someone then throw in a dumpster. Mm -hmm. He went overseas and made deals with foreign governments. 10% for the big guy. Right. We all know yeah. who that and he's walking around like there's no who the among problem. us. Who, yeah. Yeah. Who <laughs> among us has to make deals 10% for the big guy. But I mean. It's that's the point of it, too, is just it's constantly they'll push it so far because maybe you'll get a small victory here and there. But in general, I mean, what what's ha the FBI broke the law. The FBI broke the law going after Trump, whether you like Trump or not. I get it. Mm -hmm. They broke. I've talked to my brother who's a left wing guy and he's way smarter than me, except for the left wing piece. <laughs> but I was like, dude, are you are you cool with that? Like, are you cool with what the FBI did? Because if you are, then I guess I don't know you. And so the FBI broke the law and they're still on, they're still doing interviews. The IRS before that went after conservative groups. That's no, nothing happened. She retired with a pension. We never heard from Lois Lerner again. She went to the white house so many times. It's not normal for someone from the IRS to do that, but she did. They've got over and over again. They keep doing th Hunter Biden with this stuff and Ukraine and, and China and everything. It is just to demoralize you because I'm pretty demoralized. I, I, the only thing I can try to affect is my life, you know, is kind of like what I can do in the immediate circle around me. Like, you know, just and adopting, adopting another old dog. OK, I can make yeah. I can make the world a little bit better there. I can volunteer for some of the vet organizations that I do stuff like I can do things like that. But I think the only thing that's going to change it, honestly, is the country goes through some major loss because right now we've had the adults in the room keep telling the kids, don't touch the hot stove. IE don't spend more money than you have. You know, the green new deal is going to destroy the little guy over and over again. You know, we can't, we can't be weak overseas. And I mean, all the things we've been talking about forever, I think the only way yet they still vote for these people. So I think the only way it goes down is if there's some national pain, uh, where people go, they actually start losing shit. Like, you know, gas does go to six bucks a gallon or they actually do lose a freedom or they can't do this. Or all of a sudden their life is affected really tangibly as opposed to theoretically, because right now so much of it is theory and, and it's not really real. But when it becomes real, maybe then, but by then, you know, the, the, the converse argument is, well, by then the damage is done. Well, okay, yeah. I, it is. Yeah, but don't you think it's a win-win for them? Like these things can be interconnected. Like either you're demoralized or you act on it. And if if a bunch of conservatives act on it, then it confirms the white supremacists. Are, are exactly right. Exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Dude, we saw last year, we saw cities being burned to the ground mm -hmm. and no one covered it. Not really. Peaceful mm -hmm. protests. I mean, they actually were trapping law enforcement people in government buildings and lighting it on fire. No big deal. No big deal. They had they legitimate, they had legitimate causes. They're angry, and this is what you do. Kamala Harris and other people actually paid money to bail them out. No big deal. No big deal. January 6th, a bunch of people go to the Capitol. They break the law. If they broke the law, they should pay for it. And that's an insurrection. Like it literally an insurrection to them. Okay.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, something about that. I, I, I'd love to see the Capitol Hill police also charged for letting everybody up on the Capitol steps mm-hmm. and letting everybody into the Capitol. You know, the, the, the Capitol police enabled everything that day. And frankly, I believe 100% that if the Capitol police had not let those people up on the Capitol steps, they never would have broke in. Because once they were up on the Capitol steps, they had access to, you know, 100 year old windows that had that went into like a kitchen or something. And that's, you know, but then there's also a new video of where the Capitol Police opened up the doors to the Capitol and said, hey, look, if you come in and you're going to be peaceful, then everything will be OK. But you got to treat this as sacred ground. Um, so I don't, and I don't think you can call this an attempted insurrection unless the like the, the, the protesters actually believe that by occupying the Capitol building, they gain control yeah. of the government. Yeah. <laughs> Which I mean, I don't know what, what their mindset was, but I, I think it's kind of unlikely they believed that. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe the I think if you were going to have an insurrection, you probably need guns, right? That would also help, <laughs> I think. Yeah, right. That would that would help. That would certainly help. Yeah, it, it, the whole thing was a shit show. But um, yeah, this this thing with um, you know with the media, I just think it's kind of for conservatives. It's just kind of time to move on from the double standard thing. I think that's you know at this point, is is there anything different that, with what Hunter Biden was doing than what the Clinton and the Clinton Foundation did? No. Not really. They're selling influence. I mean, even the Obamas set up their own style Clinton Foundation and Global Initiative after they got out of the White House. So, I mean, this is kind of this this uh, scam that they run where they sell they sell influence, uh, essentially. And I don't think um, it's I don't think it's limited to the Dems. It's not limited to the Dems. Well, yeah, the I mean, that's what Peter Schweitzer. I mean, the first couple books were pretty apolitical. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, and I think you know, look at Mitch McConnell. His, isn't his wife a Chinese national? And they, I mean, and they, they're they're millionaires. And it's it's the government. It's the government. It's like if you get that kind of power and you get to spend other people's money, and you get to make deals and stuff like that, you get rich pretty quick. There's a reason why none of these people seem to just want to get in office and then go back to their farms like they did in colonial times. Right. right? I mean, it becomes a career. It was never meant to be a career, but it's a career now. And yeah. so when you're, yeah. yeah, they all they all know each other. It's it's a it's a cocktail thing behind. Yeah. Think, well, and also I think part of it is it's not even it's just a career. It's a stepping stone to like the next thing. Yeah. Right. No. Hundred percent right. Yeah, I mean it's all who you know. Yeah. Yeah. Elaine Cho is that? Cho. Is that- Chow, yeah, I mean, she's they're invested in all kinds of Chinese. I companies. think there is an ethics investigation into her uh, for something. Yeah. Yeah, there yeah. was. There was. I mean, I think it's. It must be. I think it is probably more like her family. I'm. You know, I'm sure that she's somehow connected. But I mean, she has held numerous government positions, so she's been through. Well, I mean, of in Republican administrations. So, right. I don't know. Um, you know, I mean, she used to speak at at CPAC for years. Those are like <laughs> non-recording stories I can give you, but. <laughs> It's yeah, I mean, just, she, she goes yeah. way back to like Bush administration. Um, she's she's like Mitch. She's sort of like a creature of Washington, creature of the swamp, and mm-hmm. um, you know, it's it's again, um, you know, once again, you just kind of got really bad staffing hires. But at the same time, it's sort of like these are the people that were available at the time to Trump. Um, well, you know, and I mean, Trump is an outsider, and he got a lot of his recommendations from organizations that he thought he could trust and for I mean for a large part of it I mean maybe he could you know like the Heritage Foundation um but at the end of the day even the Heritage Foundation is a bureaucracy uh, of DC mm-hmm. even though there are good people there yeah it's the same with any think tank I don't care what it is it could be the Goldwater Institute which I think a lot of but I mean it's they're, they're bureaucracies they have self-interest and you know it's it's about it's all who you know in that town to a large degree so Correction, anyway, are you still in Utah? You're in Utah, right? I'm in Idaho. Yep. Oh, you're in Idaho. Because it was That's interesting. Right. One of the things in your book, you talked about Orrin Hatch and how yeah. I thought that was really cool. You know, and you hear stories like that, like whatever you whatever you want to say about him, whatever. Yeah. That was pretty great that he kept up with you and also help actually helped you instead of just, you know, didn't shake your hand and say, okay, kid, take it easy, right? I mean, so that was a political, very po- a powerful political guy that was invested and, and actually took the time to, to help your case, right? Yeah, that's true. I think he was the highest ranking member of the Senate at the time. Um, and yeah, I mean, he spent hours with me and Walter Reed and, and I hate politicians, but that guy 
it treated me pretty good, you know. Yeah, so, I thought that was that was a really that was an interesting thing in in your book about that too. I was like, uh, yeah. right on, man. You know, yeah. they people surprise you. You know, people and when people say all politicians are bad, I think that's bullshit. I think I think a lot of them are good, and they they maybe want to do the right thing. I think what happens is the the meat grinder just crushes them, and they have to make deals to get deals and. Next thing you know, you owe this guy for this, and ah, shit. All right, I'll sign that for you, but you got to give me this highway bill, and, and, right. and it's, it just keeps going on and on, dude. And it's like you know, I think the, the GOP man, they're at best the majority of them are the people who wanted to be in uh, student government when you were in high school, you know? <laughs> and at worst, they're you know just as bad as the most corrupt person on the other side. So I mean, there I'm not saying there's not a handful. I think Thomas Massey's super cool. Um, you know, he seems like a really good guy. There's, there's some good dudes. Joe Kent's running. He's a great guy. You know, Joe I, I, Kent, yeah, Joe, Joe Kent, dude. I mean, we got a campaign for that guy. Do you guys know who he is? Do you guys mm -hmm. know who he is? Oh, is he the like Superman looking guy? That's yes. Him. Yeah. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yes, like guy. he is. Yeah. He's a, he's a green beret. And so he's from my world and he, uh, he lost his wife in combat. His yeah, wife was a that. Intel gal working with special operations people and she got killed. And, uh, wow. he's just an America first. He's the he's the best guy, man. You should have, we should maybe have him. You, I'll ask him. He's, so cool. on. he's a he's a really really articulate, and he gives a shit. He's an America first guy. He backed Trump. I mean, he's like us. He has no illusions about you know maybe who Trump was, but what Trump was able to do, or at least try to try to do to to get us back. Kent is uh, and he's running against a uh, kind of an establishment Republican. He's Herrera. He's out in Washington. It's, yeah, so he's but he's such a great guy. And there's I think. Uh, Hey Braxton, isn't Ron Moeller running for? Uh, I think Ron Moeller's running for South Dakota, like a state senate yeah, or state right. house. I think that's right. Yeah, and the thing that's great about Joe too is if you listen to him, I watch most of his stuff on YouTube, but he, he's really done his homework. The guy knows the yes. issue. He's like not just up there saying you know Trump was great and we hate the establishment. Like he actually knows the policies and stuff. So yeah, he's, he's not just doing the vote for me because I'm a combat vet guy. Like he's yeah. actually. He knows shit. <laughs> he's way more <laughs> literate. He's way more literate about it than I am, and he's way more articulate. And I hope, I hope he does well. He has to be. Just yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's a little far. Like, it's, that is, yeah, you're right. That's not really a compliment to Joe. <laughs> that dude, that dude is like straight out of central casting. I mean, I, I haven't seen, I haven't seen a chin like that since like Pat Tillman, maybe Bruce Campbell, or or Terry Shepard. I mean, just. <laughs> The lantern jaw. I mean, you, I mean that guy could either be in a mask, Batman or Superman, or or he could just be some badass Green Beret that's cast in a remake of the Green Berets. I mean, it's, right. It's he also kind of for uncanny. a long time he had really long hair yeah. too, and he was like, dude, I was like, I, I will follow this this man who looks like Jesus wherever he wishes to take me. <laughs> yeah, the Jesus I'll, Green Beret. Will I, I will convert low? I will eat the loaves and fishes, Joe. That you <laughs> for us. We should we, we should call him the Passion. Who who is uh, who is that baseball player um, that they called the Passion? Johnny something, but he had the beard and he had the long hair. I mean, look, and he was all muscular. Um, oh, uh, oh dude, from Boston? Yeah, I think I Damon. Think Johnny, Johnny Damon. Damon. Johnny Damon. They, Johnny yeah, Damon. the guys. The, the no, guys. I'm the one that knows that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, guys, the guys in the ball club, all, all of his teammates used to call him that. They used, they, they used to call him the passion because he because he looked like Jim could be like a muscular Jim could. Yeah, be. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope Kent does well, man. He's he's got a. I mean, where he's running is like, yikes. But Mitt Romney's fundraising hit against him right now too. Oh, so, really? Of course. So you know he's good. Yeah. <laughs> Badge of honor, right there, man. Yeah. That's all you need. That's all you kind of need to know. Um, Zinke's yeah. back too. I read he's running he? for Senate in Montana. Yeah. Who is Zinke? Ryan Zinke. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. He, he, I thought he did a really good job at Secretary of the Interior. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Braxton, you you can talk about that probably on a, on a far more expansive level than I can, but. Uh, you know, he, he. I remember he went and dealt with the Mustangs, which now is all fucked up. And he did, he did some very good things. I remember following him when he was the Secretary of the Interior because I got interested in that stuff because of Teddy Roosevelt. Because he, you know, because I was like, why, why was he so interested in this stuff? And then I started researching on why it was important for Teddy Roosevelt to preserve the lands and expand the forests and 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 whatnot. You know, and it's like it's like Rush used to say, we have more trees now in America than we did when it was founded. And you could credit Teddy Roosevelt a lot to that because of the national parks. 
Um, but I always thought Zinke did a good job. I could be wrong, but um, – no, he did some good things. Rescinding yeah. Bears ears, you know, was a big deal. It was a really big deal deal for ranchers. See, a lot of people don't understand that the left, you know, of course, they well, they understand this part, but they practice incrementalism, right? So when they make something a monument within the next like 10 to 50 years, it ends up a national park. So be like, hey, don't worry about it. You'll still be able to graze on it and all wow. that. Like, no big deal. Well, okay, for maybe one generation and then they take it away. So Utah, I think, has seven uh, national parks or maybe it's six. And either five or six of those started as monuments and then they become, you know, parks and you're just booted out. No more hunting, no more fishing, no more. Well, some some you can fish, mm -hmm. but, you know, no more hunting, no more grazing, none of that. And the, what the left does is they say, well, we're just trying to make it so people can't drill oil on this stuff. It's like, well, that's like the entry point. You know, eventually they just want to take it away. That's like Biden's 30 by 30 initiative that I, you know, you know constantly mm -hmm. prattling on about because no one in the conservative right seems to understand how big of a deal it is, you know. But yeah, if we had Zinke in there, this stuff like this 30 by 30 would never happen. And what I is 30 by 30? Because like that's kind of the problem with Hunter Biden is he's like the shiny object that everybody focuses on. And there's all these yeah. other little things. That's that right. Out. Yeah, explain yeah. it, Braxton. So the 30 by 30 initiative was actually written up by um, what's his name from New Mexico? Uh, Anyway, he wrote that. Is that, he wrote, is that Bill Richardson? Is that no, Richardson? No. Mm -hmm. The uh, former governor? No, he's a, I think he's a senator from down there right now. In mm -hmm. fact, I'll, I'll pull it. I think his last name starts with a T. But but anyway, he he and the Nature Conservancy put together this plan. And, you know, ostensibly it's to preserve 30 percent of America's land and 30 percent of America's water by the year 2030. But the full plan is 50 percent by 2050 of each of those, respectively. Well, 30% of America's land is an, an area like twice the size of Texas. I mean, it's not, this is not a small chunk of stuff. So right now the BLM own, or excuse me, Forest Service and BLM own something like 187 million acres. And in order to, for these things to be preserved, these, this acreage to be preserved correctly or this, whatever, it, they would have to get to something like 400 million acres. So you're going to have to almost double the size of the lands that are under federal control right uh -huh. now. And they're being very vague about what it means to be, you know, um, conserved, you know. So yeah. we don't know if that, like, the best you can tell by reading the plan, or the memo, rather, is a monument, wilderness with a capital W. So, like, we have a lot of that here in Idaho and a little bit in Utah, that kind of stuff. California has a lot. So monument ground, national park, wilderness with a capital W. And originally, they had made it sound like maybe reservation land counted there, but it doesn't. <laughs> so, yeah, they won't go there. <laughs> right. Well, so in the memo, it says that they're going to form public private partnerships in order to do this. Well, what the hell does that mean? That means so, deeded they, land. That's what that means. Correct. And so if you take a place like, say, Nebraska, which I think is 97 percent publicly or privately owned, how do you preserve 30 percent of the land and or water, more importantly, to agriculture? How do you preserve that? You're talking t some kind of mm. eminent domain. Right. Right. You know, that's the only thing I can think of, because we've, we've got Cochise County, uh, home of Wyatt Earp and, and Geronimo down in uh, southern part of Arizona, which borders New Mexico. That's 90 percent deeded. I mean, that's essentially what you're talking about. If you go down there and you're going to usurp a certain amount of land, it's probably going to be deeded, man. It's going to be it's going to be owned by someone else because th that's that's who owns that stuff. Right. And this this is a global plan. I mean, it, it's it, the memo yeah. is totally worth reading. It's this is a global plan. Mm -hmm. Anytime the Nature Conservancy is involved, people should be very skeptical. <laughs> Let me put it like well, that. Did you did you guys really? hear about Bl BlackRock going into? Oh yeah, um, yeah. It's in, in the Cal in the California residential areas and buying homes and overbidding mm -hmm. uh, first time home buyers and people by twenty to fifty percent. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a corporation going and buying. You know, of course, Ben Shapiro and the conservatives are saying, oh, you know, capitalism, you know, it's free markets. You know, you know, what do you care who buys who buys that? You know, what do you care? That's where they're that's where they're fucked up. This is where yeah. those guys don't get it because yeah. they it makes this this and, and they're good guys. Like I think Shapiro is a very smart guy. He's a, he's a very great conservative thinker. No, same and here. Same here. I, and he's know, done I, great. I, I, and he's done a lot of great work, I think. But I think what's interesting is this is where a lot of those guys are missing this. And like what Braxton's talking about, there's a long ball game here being played yeah. that we're just mm -hmm. not engaged in. And and so that's the thing. And it sounds conspiratorial when you talk about it because you're like, well, you know, these Chinese corporations are buying all this land or Bill Gates is doing this and then he's getting us off of beef and all this. All these little things that are just, you know, and the energy stuff. 
-hmm. all these things. If you talk about it, you sound like Alex Jones or something like that. But, <laughs> but which by the way, he's, Alex Jones has actually been right on a lot of shit. Let's admit it. I know. Yeah. And, because frogs are because frogs are turning gay, <laughs> and, uh, but 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 you know what I mean. Like I think that's the big problem, and that's why China has been so successful up till now too. Because they they don't they play long ball. They just they're not worried about navel gazing, uh, pronouns, transgender stuff. They're not they're not worried about pissing anybody off. They just they just keep acquiring. They just keep moving. They keep. They don't give ground. China does not give ground. And so the left does not give ground. And like what Braxton's saying about it being a global thing, you're right, dude. I hadn't, I mean, I, what you're talking about specific, I, I haven't been plugged into that, but yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, it's long ball and we're distracted by Hunter Biden's bullshit right. or this, you know, Kamala Harris, you know, saying have a nice weekend on Memorial day. Fuck you. We know what that is, <laughs> but, but they are playing long ball and you know, I don't know, man. I, it's I right in front of you. Well, and also, even though whenever they talk about something being global, there's always carve outs for China. Mm -hmm. It's always mm -hmm. about hitting America. It's not global. Every it's time. It's just a way to like lessen it, like, oh, everyone's participating. Every but time, Lisa, that's right. Every oh, time. Like, even right. in the uh, like the Paris Climate Accord, if you, you got to set your own goals, and if you didn't meet them, you got to revise them however you wanted. <laughs> So like we were getting shamed for not being part of it, but literally, I mean, it's, no one's really part of it when you can just do that. You can just do whatever you want, yeah. basically. So yeah. Matt, do you know if BlackRock is owned or has Chinese claws in there or ownership? I, I was. I mean, it's, a, I it's a multi. It's like a hundred plus billion dollar company, so I'm sure they have you know foreign funds that are invested in it. But I don't know what you know percent the ownership is. Yeah. Uh, but it's you know it's, it's pretty much inevitable that they they do just because I mean, they are. You know, the argument on the other side is if you're the person selling the house and somebody comes in and, you know, maybe you don't know who it is. Uh, it's just some entity that comes in and makes well, of an course offer. they're going to take the deal. But. Yeah, it's, it's 20 to 50 percent over what all these other people. Yeah. But, but but at the same time, it's kind of like it's this idea that capitalism can't have a conscience, that everything well, that's, that's has thing. to be just, about the bottom line. Just because you can make money some way does not mean, A, you're you're adding net value to society and B, that it's okay. Like We see this happening in the right. pharmaceutical industry where there's this huge phenomenon where people buy up old patents you know, 10 years after, after a drug has been made. They hike the price a thousand percent and then keep selling it and make no changes. And it's technically illegal. They make a lot of money doing it, but is it is it right? And and is there a role for government? And yeah, that, that's a serious question to ask. Well, it's just it, it's just like a, go ahead, go, go ahead, dude. Good. Let me throw a possibility out there. BlackRock knows that the Fed is going to back them if they mm -hmm. you know if they have any problem. Well, currency inflation, like inflation, is happening. We're printing money like crazy, and for years now, people have been saying there's another housing bubble. Yeah. So maybe the federal government is going, you know what, we need to float this economy as much as we can. So if we go and purchase these things and try to like soften the come down of the, you know, the real estate bubble, mm. like that might be that might be what they're thinking because they're going to turn them into rentals. Right. They're, they're I not think that's the goal. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And it is. I mean, it. it I, I, you know, my, my conspiratorial aspect is thinking they all want us to be serfs. Um, but you know, it could just be, Hey, there's going to be a lot of inflation. Hard assets tend to go up with inflation, like, you know, like homes, gold, silver, whatever. Um, so it could just be, you know, a hedge against that as well to some extent. Definitely. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's either those things, if there's a crash and those things all go back to the bank mm -hmm. and they're, they're bank owned properties, they're going to be sold, you know, basically on the short, they're going to be, mm -hmm. you know, large, they're, they're probably going to be like, uh, you know, uh, buy as is, you know, cash. 30 day close and you know you, you can't go and walk inside it you just got to look at the outside which is typically what happened after the 08 crash and all those home people just mailing in their keys or the banks just go or the houses go back to the bank and they become bank owned properties they sell them at a discount or they sell them in large chunks to investors who will then take them and rehab them and rent them so um but everything has an effect like 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 matt was saying and braxton was saying is like for example, like right here, Lisa, you've been at my you've been at my place. The beach is just that way, right behind me, mm -hmm. and there's a ho one house before you get there. Uh, he's a friend of mine. I didn't know he was going to do this because the housing market's so crazy right now. He asked a ridiculous amount for that house, and within a day, it was bought sight unseen from mm -hmm. someone in New York. So I have a new neighbor now that's going to be renting it out and everything like that. And this is happening all over the Outer Banks, and not only that too. A lot of people here on the outer, and this is just a microcosm of what's going on in the country because things change, right? 
So I get it. You're selling your house. It's your house. You're going to sell it for a lot of money. What's, what's happening is, though, because this is a, you know, a summer economy where people come down here and you need people to work at all these restaurants and all these other things. A lot of people and a lot of people don't have that much money who actually live here. So they rent uh, they rent they rent houses and stuff. Well, now they're being told you are selling it. You got to go. Mm-hmm. So there's actually there's people living in, in some tents down the way here, I think, down in like Christine, my girl was telling me about this. Like it's becoming a real problem because now if you can get that kind of money, it's kind of what are you going to tell somebody not to sell their house? Because it's like right. you can get like 200 grand over what it's worth. Mm-hmm. But then it does have these snowballing effects where now the whole this the Outer Banks is going to change because of this. And, you know, that's just a small thing. But and I'm not smart enough to understand all the economics of it. But for sure. There's stuff coming down the road that I think it's going to be going to be interesting, to say the least. You know? Another really big problem that no one knows about um, ag land in the West has gone crazy. Um, so anything that's tillable ground with irrigation is going between five thousand and fifteen thousand dollars an acre. Yeah. I've run the numbers every which way I can, and there is absolutely no way that you can pay for a farm at six thousand dollars an acre. There's, it's not possible. No right. Way. So yeah, the only way out is to break that up and build homes on it. At you know at those numbers, and we got the same problem in Cochise County with um, there's just a huge land shortage. Not only stuff for private residences and homes, but also farmland. Mm-hmm. It's just being gobbled up like crazy. Yeah. Grazing ground has gone up in Idaho about 120% in just the last two years. Damn. And we're trying to expand. And, you know, we were looking at this one place and I sat down with my wife and we were talking about it and there's just, there's no way to make it pay for itself. It's just, Can't do it. Can't you know. do it. So what yeah. happens to it then? Like, how does it, what, what's the, what's the, how does it roll? A lot of, so some farmers will just, buy an add on knowing that it's going to like their grandchildren are going to have to pay for it, you know, but they're right. just keep the farm together. But a lot of it is getting bought by investment companies and right. like a farm right below us. Here's another shady, really dirty, ugly deal that happened. A farm, right? Like this is part of why our land exploded in value, but there's a farm just below us. That's like, it's about 3000 acres or so big place. Um, it was for sale for, I forget what the heck it was. Anyway, anyway, they bought the this investment group came in and bought it for four thousand dollars an acre like six years ago or so, which was like fifteen hundred or so dollars an acre over what it was actually worth. Right. Well, now I don't want to give away where I'm at, but now there's a um, a new government facility being built about ten miles from this farm. Well, in Idaho, you can put a you can always get a well permit no matter what. They can't deny you a well permit. So you basically you can subdivide anything you want in Idaho. Hmm. So this big chunk of ground got bought way over market value. Turns out that two of the investors in the company are politicians. So like go figure. Like you really think they didn't know that project was gonna, you know, start five years ago? I'm the sure it was accidental, man. It just was fortuitous. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's how Harry Reid got rich, was through local Nevada real estate. He he bought up all kinds of commercial tracks where he knew that there was gonna be expansion or freeways or off right. ramps. Um, I mean that guy every, that guy would just basically gobble up vacant land that was commercial or uh, had zone variances and then would flip it to builders and then they'd go and put strip centers and, and stuff in it. But yeah, he was completely tied into the politics, the local politics in Nevada took a lot of advantage of it. So, um, you know, the other thing that happens is you get on those big tracks is you get, you get like big farms that come in. Like we down in, in my folks area, they had another dairy farm that came in 200 acres. Um, and it just, it just, you know, then there's another dairy farm to the south of it. So, I mean, you drive through this area, dude, you know, during the right time of year and it just smells like cow shit. It's <laughs> awful. I mean, you'd never want to live there. I mean, it kind of renders that area sort of, you know, sort of like radioactive. Like you just, you just kind of stay away or just roll up the windows and, and you know, and do 65 instead of 55 and just get the hell out of there. So, yeah, it's crazy. All right. So we want to move on to, uh, Netflix and America, the motion picture. Um, everybody needs to go and check this out. Watch the trailer. Uh, this comes from um, the, the same writers and animators that did Magic Mike, The Expendables, and Archer. And it just, it just, it's just so cringe and so bad. But it's basically a retelling of America's founding. They they bill it as being the untold, totally legit, historically accurate 
Origins of America, um, and it's an animated movie, and it's obviously meant for kids. It's got curse words, it's got, you know, they, which obviously doesn't bother me, but um, it's geared to kids, and kids are going to watch this, and part of the cursing, I believe, is to appear edgy, which is going to obviously be like catnip to kids, but um, they're clearly going for a, a younger demo, But it, and it's like retelling retelling the founders as the Avengers kind of it's got this X-Men like team Braxton you watch the trailer um I think Lisa watched the trailer the other two guys didn't do their homework but no. uh, I suck yeah I also suck they, they'll just have to take my word for it but it's like George Washington fighting with like Wolverine claws and fighting alongside um Abraham Lincoln so I don't know if there's time traveling or if this is just complete and total you know, revisionist bullshit. The history, thing is, but. is like there's potential to tell those stories in a cool way. Like, I mean, you and I have talked about Sons of Patriot a lot. Did, like that, yeah. these were like, like badass rebel, you know, guys in their twenties type of people. Um, but instead, you know, it's more of like in a joking way than, and I don't mean educational, like boring way, because that's generally how the right would choose to do something. Um, so it's kind of like a missed opportunity because it's like the meat, the medium is correct. Um, but we didn't do it first. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I had this idea with Larry Schweikert like four years ago, Larry Schweikert wrote Patriots history of the United States, which is a New York times bestselling book. Um, it still charts on Amazon. I mean, really high people love this book and it was an answer to, it was Larry's answer to Howard Zinn's, uh, people's history of the United right. States, which is just a communist, bullshit, which is bullshit. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's the one where the, 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 the Sopranos actually lampooned in an episode. Really? I yeah. That up. Anthony, it's in the first three episodes, first three seasons somewhere, which is so the, the anti-Italian discrimination. Uh... Exactly. Exactly. Is that well, actually the clip? That's the one. That's the episode. Oh, all right. So I haven't but seen it, it then. But it opens up with Anthony reading out of this book, and he's talking about how his history teacher was teaching from this book, and they were talking about how Milo if Milosevic, Milosevic, or uh, if Columbus was alive today, he would be considered like Milosevic. Yes. Right. Okay. I remember. And then Tony's like, "What?" He's like, "What is this crap that they're teaching you?" You know, Tony obviously being the more center right guy yeah. gets all pissed off, and then and then Carmela gets pissed off too. She's like, "That's that's insane." Um, well, it's not. I mean. For the Sopranos, it's not about um, like right or left. It's that Columbus Day is very important to Italian Americans. Italians, yeah, it's Italians, man. It's oh Italians. yeah, Sal. Sal's like he's you know he, he like he's talking to Tony and he's like I give to he's like I give to the Italian American League every year. He's like this is a very touchy subject for me, <laughs> you know. But they they end up in that brawl with with like the Native Americans at the at the at the um, the Columbus, Columbus statue. Day. Yeah, yeah and, and like Artie gets like a slushy thrown at him or something. It's <laughs> it's one of the funniest episodes. But Larry wrote this book in answer to Howard Zinn's book, and it went wild. Um, Beck promoted it really heavily when it first came out. Like Larry was on like Glenn Beck for like like a week, like every day talking about this book. So I met Larry through Clinton Cash graphic novel, and I said, "Hey, it'd be really fun to do a graphic novel adaptation of the entire book." It's like a thousand pages, so you probably have to have like a series of them. But yeah. I said, if we got to the founders, I said, you know what would be really cool to do is to do what Chris Kane, Dean Kane's dad, Chris Kane directed Young Guns in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And that was a brilliant film because they they took it, it's it's very historically accurate. They don't embellish really anything other than some of the killing and some of the action. That's that's obviously kind of you know Hollywoodized up, but the Murphy Dolan gang and the Santa Fe rain and everything else within that movie is, is very real and very historically accurate. How do you market that to a young generation and get young meat in the seats, get the brat pack, get a bunch of young, <laughs> handsome actors who everybody loves, who can also act and, um, and shoot this thing, you know, realistically, you know, and it, it was perfect. You know, uh, uh, you know, that's the, the girls got in there because, they loved Emilio and Kiefer and Charlie Sheen. The boys are in there for the action. And then suddenly everybody's getting taught history and they don't even know it. And, you know, after I walked out of Young Guns with my dad, I ran home, went into my brother's room. I pulled down the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, which is the Google of the 80s. And I started reading all about Billy the Kid, William Bonney, um, you know, about the Murphy Dolan gang and the Santa Fe Reign and how they had this... Um, basically just a monopoly on that area. And they were pushing out John Tunstall who had opened up his own store to compete with the Murphy, the Murphy store. Um, 
but anyway, uh, you know, I said, Larry, I said, what if we did a graphic novel of the founders, you know, and played it up as them being like these renegades, renegades of the revolution. And they could be like these kind of muscular, robust, handsome dudes, kind of like they were back then, you know, and we make them relatable to a younger audience. And it's almost kind of like they're superheroes. So when I saw this Netflix, Netflix thing, I was just like, they beat me to it. You know, they took it too far in, in the abstract of being like almost like really acting like comic book heroes, which you really don't have to do that. But at the same time, they're marketing it in a way for kids and they're telling their own version of history, which is obviously going to be some left wing woke revisionist crap. And here we are, conservatives finding ourselves as not cultural creators, but cultural observers. So we sit around and we allow this vacuum to fill and then we complain when the left fill it because you know, we don't like it, you know? And it's kind of like, well, if we were- Well, and it just makes creators, it, it like over and over just makes us seem like uncool and like the nags when they're really the nags. Right, and that's true. And we're the ones that are reacting to, um, oh, that's dangerous for kids or, oh, they said a bad word. And that's what we always get played as. Well, the, the other thing that pissed me off was when I saw comments and they're like, oh, it's just a cartoon. Oh, it's just a comic book. Oh, it's just a movie. Look, if we're going to take this rarefied air that comic books and cartoons and entertainment doesn't matter, then, you know, maybe that's fine for you. But you know what that means is that means that those are all, if we don't engage in those mediums, those are people that we'll never talk to. They're people we'll never interact with. And a lot of these are apolitical people. So we'll never have an influence on them. So, you know, when you take that attitude, oh, it's just a cartoon. Yeah, but a lot of people are going to watch it. And it's something we don't like. And, and, and instead of being creators and reaching out to those people ourselves with our own animated movie of America, we sat around and let the left do it. And then, and then you know, it's like, surprise, surprise, we don't like what they did. I mean, I mean you know, when are we going to break out of this cycle? It, it's just stupid. I don't know. The problem is, like most of our media like, content creators historically have not been that great at a, like, and I'm only thinking of film in particular. Um, but I don't know. Like that, I wonder how much of it too is just like personal preference. Like I think the reason most professors are liberals is because most people who prefer to teach are, are liberals themselves to begin with, and those who want to use their degree to make money are probably more likely to be conservative. Um, and I wonder if it's just a natural thing in, in the arts that just people who have that talent just naturally have to lean that way or, you know. Well, I think that's right. All yeah. art is emotion, right? Yeah, exactly. It's more emotional, so. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah but at the same time, I, I look at, you know, groupthink as being really the antithesis of creativity. So, uh, you know, I mean, creativity is free. It's open. It can be whatever it wants. It's going to abhor groupthink. If it's well, from the nuts, and bolts, the nuts and bolts point of this, though, and when we talk to Nick Searcy about this, because I've talked to him, we talked to him here, but I also talked to him, you know, by myself. And it, <clears throat> what's happened is we, we've lost. We, nice flex. What's that? I said nice flex. What's, what's the flex? <laughs> flex. <laughs> when I talk to him by myself. Oh yeah, I talked to Nick. Uh, I just he talked to Nick. I just called Nick's in my phone. Nick. He texts right text me too, Terry. I, text, text, I, I type in N I C, and it's already Nick Cersei. So you know, you guys are better. <laughs> you're not as good as me. Shut up, Lisa. So the, I mean, but he's right about. He said that there's no way to do this now except to almost create a new Hollywood because, and that takes a lot of money because now it's gotten to the point like you're right, Braxton. Artists tend to be that way because they are. And I get it. They're they're generally emotionally driven, but it's we've we've sort of lost it over the over these decades, just sort of abdicating the idea that, you know, if you're conservative, you're not a creative person. Uh, well, and also conservatives tend to want to see an immediate like bang for their buck and they don't want something subtle that takes place over 10 or 20 years. They want a documentary showing um, Clinton corruption. <laughs> Clinton corruption <laughs> or, you know, it, I mean, and all of us have done some form of what has been acceptable conservative entertainment. So I'm not like dogging any of that, but we just don't want to play the long game. I mean, that seems to be like the theme of this, uh, this episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And well, and, and now because, and now it becomes to the point where if you have a project or, or something, you've got to get it in front of people. 
and they're not particularly sympathetic to your cause or they're just, they're just like, yeah, whatever. We don't really need to do that. Mm-hmm. But the other thing is, though, and, it, and this drives me nuts, man, like in a way, it's, part of it has to do with the country's got to go down. For example, when Gina Carano got fired by Disney, right? Gina Carano gets fired by Disney for really innocuous shit, basically just not being radically left wing. None of her. She wouldn't, but, yeah, I mean, if, if, if the squad did it, it would be, you know. Fine. Right. So but but here's the thing. This is why this is why we're in trouble, though, because the citizens of the United States are so weak and so not willing to actually fucking stand for something. I, I don't, I'm not a call for boycott thing, but I try to in my life. Generally, if I know someone is out there in public threatening me, saying I should die, insulting me, denigrating me, I'm, I'm not going to really willingly give them money. Like I just that's yeah. not someone I'm going to give my money to. Yeah. So like Carano gets fired from Disney and then like on and everyone on Twitter is all blah, blah, blah. Which by the way, I haven't even logged back into Twitter since I got back and I, I kind of don't miss it. But everyone's on Twitter talking about, you know, oh, this is such bullshit. How could this happen? You know, and her cast members didn't stand up for her and the blah, blah, blah. And then two days later, like, man, I can't wait to see that new Avengers shit yeah. on Disney. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what the right. fuck are you doing? St- cancel your Disney subscription. If it really mean, if it doesn't mean anything to you, then, then fine. Just go about your merry way. But if you're going to get mad about something and then not do anything about it, not I kind of don't have that much sympathy for you. And that's the public right now because they're just same with the NFL. You know, like I, I, I'm a football player, dude. I played through, I, you know, I, I was a college, a small college, but I, I'm a football guy. Like that's football to me, prep me for the military. It prepped me for so much in life. I'm a huge football fan. I haven't really watched NFL for years now because I just don't want to give an organization money that's so F you to me in my face. And so, but, but people aren't doing that. So I'm not going to, I don't go on Twitter and say, man, what's wrong with you people? You should boycott Disney or you should cancel Disney or not watch NFL. But if everybody actually personally took a stand and said, all right, I'm not going to give them my money. Why, they would change like overnight because the only way you can affect them is to take money out of their pocket. You can't yell at them. You can't try to argue with them. You can't show the, the, the logic or lack of logic of how you fire this person. But, you know, the other cast member can say all sorts of other stuff, radical things on the other side. They're OK. You, none of that. That means nothing to them. The only thing they care about is making money. But if we have a population that is just worried about what's on Netflix or just I want to watch the game. I don't really care. Okay, then you're going to get what you're going to get. It's not going to change. It isn't going to change. It's a real apathy among the culture. Yeah, it is. It is. And and that's you know the and and that's part of the demoralization as well. And and I I, I will say this too: it's been kind of a sacrifice to not watch football because I I fucking love football, and I'm tempted to watch it. And there's a couple times I'm flipping through and I like watch a couple downs. I'm like, you know what, dude? It's for me. I'm doing it for me. Yeah, NFL doesn't care. They don't care about me. But like, I feel better knowing that I'm not giving money to somebody who's just sticking it to me. And I feel like when people are like pissed about Carano getting fired and then they're still talking about, oh man, this new Star Wars or this new Avengers thing. I'm like, you're fuck. I'm sorry, dude, you're weak. Cause yeah. if you're worried about your entertainment and not about what that stands for in a bigger picture, then you, you deserve everything that's coming to you. You do. I agree. Look I think we should save time. our money and then give it to AOC's grandma instead. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, go off topic. Dana White did with the UFC. You know, he stayed out of politics, and now they got a huge deal with ESPN. And you know, well, I mean, I guess he got involved with the Trump campaign, but I just mean he doesn't allow his athletes to be to make political stances um, in the octagon or whatever. And they're growing. They're like the fastest growing sport in the world. You know. So yeah. Clearly, you, you, yeah. Right. And you could argue about the UFC too. Like, you know, I, I, you know, UFC guys, I know, you know, MMA guys and, you know, they weren't treated very well by the UFC in the early years. Like those guys were not being paid and you know, right. the rest of the organization was getting hugely, fabulously wealthy. Now I think that's changing, but I mean, it, you're right though. Like it, it, the, the public will, will, will take, will the public will give what you, what you sell. But I mean, like, I just feel like, I don't know, man, it, could you live without Disney for a couple months? Yeah. Well, because think, like if, if everybody what you were talking about them, earlier about people need to feel pain before they sort of know what's going on. And I think that's the problem is, you know, for a lot of people, um, 
you know, Disney, Disney Plus is like their babysitter and they will feel yeah. pain if they were to take some action. And that's uh, true. Yeah, I get I that. I get probably that. wouldn't wouldn't do it beyond. I mean, just, you know, speaking for myself, like I think Brent, we were talking the other day and I was kind of like, well, what would Amazon Prime have to do for me to boycott Amazon Prime? And it would be like uh, not deliver in less than 48 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man. I mean, Amazon's has changed the psychology of of just not only buying things, but also shipping. You know, as, as somebody who ships my own stuff, um, it's just kind of, you know, it, we've got to that point where, you know, if I can't get it in two to three days, you know, what the hell's wrong with this vendor? Like, what's right. wrong with you? Mm -hmm. That's what's true. What's wrong with you, dude? You know, I, I ordered a used book from Amazon. Two weeks go by, never get the book. <laughs> I checked the, the tracking. The guy never shipped it, so I canceled that order, ordered it from Amazon, and got it in like 14 hours. Yeah. yeah. So that's, yeah. It, it yeah. sucks that I have to use them, but uh, yeah, I am a hypocrite. <laughs> it's, it's a tough one because the convenience is so fantastic, and especially over COVID because I didn't want to go and shop places where you have to wear a mask. So if I can get it delivered to my house, then problem solved. Yeah. Plus, you can get all of our books on Amazon. That's true. That, that as well. It's yeah. where most yeah, of the deals yeah. are, actually. A lot of people complain to me about that, by the way. They want to buy through a different source, so I don't know. I, on my Twitter, I put, like, my publisher's page, but it's everywhere you could buy it, so no one can call me a hypocrite. But even <laughs> even from there, everyone picks Amazon, so. Yeah, the I, I mean, yeah, yeah. I got. I still got to buy Palumbo's book. He's going to kill me. But, I mean, you got to actually <laughs> more than one. But, like, on Lisa's stuff, I mean, I got at uh, Braxton. I bought your book from, from, from uh, Amazon. You know, I mean, it is what yeah. it is. There, seventy percent football. Today is the one year, or no, three year anniversary of me having a number one football biography. What? Look at that flex. Who's flexing now? <laughs> All right. <laughs> that is never sold. <laughs> do, do, do you want to? Do you want to talk about this book now that you're? Yeah. Do you, you want to show it? Oh me? Yeah. No. No. It's, Let's talk about Braxton's book since Terry has good things to say about that. <laughs> no, so, you know, Matt, you were talking, you know, something you said about the Clinton, Clinton cash documentary, you know, we made a Clinton cash documentary mm -hmm. and it preached to the, it preached to the converted, you know, it was the graphic right. novel, which reached yeah. out to young people. And, and again, you know, you know, Netflix is smart. The left is smart. They play the long game. They use mediums. They know they, that young people are going to consume and the right is too busy. Infrastructure. They do, they do. Yeah. But I mean, the right is instead of investing in a TV studio or an animation studio or graphic novels or TV or movie or whatever, you know, they're too busy cutting checks to think tanks and PR consultants and political ads and whatnot. Well, we are fortunately seeing like a rise in the right when it comes to, I think, like alternative news media, like, you know, The Blaze and CRTV and all those. It's just we're not we're not positioning ourselves to influence people all throughout their life. Like if, I mean, you, it, it theoretically possible, especially if you live in a city to go through your entire life without ever hearing a single right wing perspective, because yeah. everyone around you is a liberal, every celebrity you see is growing up to be a liberal, every musician you hear, uh, so on and so forth. And we're not positioned in any of those areas to kind of get our message in. We just, you kind of have to know where to look to find us. Mm -hmm. well, well, and also there have been times when we have, and by we, I say me, <laughs> because there are some that have taken a chance, like Post Hill has taken a chance on some non-traditional books, um, you know, like a humor book or, um, you know, being a, a girl, I'm maybe I'm not, you know, as tuned into like the comic stuff and the, the boy, the boy culture. So, you know, I chose to wrote, write a chiclet type of book. Mm -hmm. Um, that was fiction because the majority of it is is very liberal. And um, part of it is probably because, you know, I don't have uh, the, out the outreach to, you know, reach millions of women like, you know, someone, um, you know, having a nice book review in People Magazine or, you know, whatever the doctor's offices have. And, um, you know, I'm not gonna get on The View uh, and, you know, give away a thousand copies or, you know, anything like that. <laughs> and we also don't support each other because we, obviously we are able to sell lots of, of books outside of that. But um, 
I'm not saying it's like male supremacy, but a little bit. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, we do tend to only hype up, um, you know, the traditional, you know, type of stuff because we, you yeah. know, don't want to take a chance. And also, you know, even, you know, in the in the Twitter world or social media world, if you talk about, um, you know, anything on TV, like if you talk about, um, what's that show, Yellowstone, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's always going to be some boomer who chimes in like, I haven't watched TV since. Blah, blah. Right. And it's like, well, you know what? Everybody else is watching TV in no, some, no. whether it's, you know, cable or whatever. Um, and I think a lot of times we just don't want to, you know, deal with it. And it's very easy to be, you know, successful and do, you know, the traditional type of books. I mean, that's what was sold to me outright is that I should write a book about I'm a conservative and a woman, but you know, I, and maybe I could have sold more books that way. Um, did you self publish Bra Braxton? Did you self publish yours? How'd that work? Yeah, we did. We actually uh, kickstarted. We had a mid tier house wanted to pick it up, but when I sat down, like going through the emails with them, I was like, "There, you guys are really not offering me anything aside from you can put me in Barnes and Noble. And I don't really care if we're in Barnes and Noble. So like if Random House would have wanted to take it, then sure, I would have done it. But yeah, we just the self-published route and just hired a decent editor and, you know, just went. Yeah. Through. Make more money that way. <laughs> I think well, and you can, you know, they, there's, well, there's, and it's like book a lot of publishers and PR people, they want to hire or get clients that, they have to do as little work as possible for. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. You know, it's they just want to sit there and, and you know, collect <coughs> a check and they expect, you know, they want to hire a name um, right. and hope, and hope, you know, that's what that brings it in. I mean, it's kind of like the people that need an agent can't get an agent. The people that don't need an agent have lots of agents trying to get their attention. <laughs> Yeah. Now the, the book has got to kind of sell itself. That's, that's what, that's what publishers are looking for. And, and how do you sell it? It's a, it, you know, if, if you're a recognizable name, um, I've done the publishing thing. I've also done the self publishing thing. And, and I'll tell you, um, there's nothing like having, you know, nearly a hundred percent of, of the royalties. Uh, you give a lot away to a publisher. Um, but if you can find a good printer and, um, there's a lot of good printers in the U S now, not only for just regular books, but also, comic books and graphic novels. So you don't have to go to China and there's, and the printers that I use are competitive with Chinese prices. So you're, you're getting that great bang for the buck. You're getting great quality, but you don't have to wait for it to come on a boat, which can mm -hmm. take upwards of four to six weeks and, and probably cost you. Yeah. Right. So how'd exactly. you, so Lisa, you did, you did the, the, on, on your uh, social justice book, was that done? Like who did, I forgot who did that. Um, it, no, all, all four books have been post Hill. They yeah. were okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, yeah, that's what I was saying. Like, I think they're they're Matt's publisher too, mm -hmm. um, yep. and they, they're pretty good at you know taking you know some chances. I mean, you're not gonna, they, you know, they are smaller, but they are distributed by Simon and Schuster, so you do have reach if um, you know some of the um, like outlets are interested. I mean, it wasn't Barnes and Noble. Um, unfortunately, it came out the same week as Hillary's book. Um, <laughs> well, that book your book like was an overlapping. You know, audio. yeah, well, that's the thing. You know, you don't have that, you don't have that, that, that power behind you that she did, but like that book was great. Like that was a real, and it was great, especially because you had Terry Shepard in it on a couple of occasions, <laughs> which made it better. But like we also had a friend, uh, Braxton, you know, uh, Clay Martin, mm -hmm. and Clay published, it was really cool because Clay, he's a Green Beret, really good gun guy, super smart, very conservative, very right wing dude. Yeah, he's pretty big. And I remember a, it was a few years ago, I think now, I reckon, Clay reached out to me and he was like, hey man, he goes, I've had this, this is when all the shit started going down, all the rioting and and, and before this summer, but it was like the, the one before that. And he's like, hey, I've been writing this stuff down. He goes, I've been wanting to put out this idea on how people can sort of get, you know, like from the Green Beret point of view of how you can prepare for this and to train for it. And, and I was like, dude, that's brilliant. And he sent me the manuscript and I looked over it. I'm, I'm nobody, but it's funny because I was, I'm not smart or talented enough to write about it, but I, I, that's in my head. And then I looked at it and I said, well, there's a lot of, a lot of grammar problems with it, shit like that. Cause it was, he just wrote it, you know, but I mean, it did pretty, and then he did, he did concrete jungle and then he did prairie fire, which was the follow-up to that. And, uh, you know, I actually 
he got him on um, – he was on – the Will Cow Majority. You guys, by the way, Braxton, you need to go on there too um, with, with your you book. Do you, Lisa, have you ever been on Andrew Will Cow's show? I don't think so. I should get all you guys. I mean, he's he's <laughs> awesome, dude. And I, but but Clay, he Clay, he's great, man. He yeah. and he'll put anybody on because he's a friend of mine and he's just a great dude. And he put Clay he has on high standards. And, yeah, <laughs> again, <laughs> shut up. Anybody on? You gotta shut up, Ho. You probably said you probably said no. You, you know what? You know what, Lisa? That's the problem with you. You're very mouthy, broad. That's the problem with you. No. Yeah, I, I said what I said. I said God. what I said. But like Clay, Clay's I make it for it by sending like you know caramel bars and stuff. I know, I know. But Clay, but Clay was on the radio, and then that's his books. I mean, I don't know how what his final sales were if they're still doing it. But like, I just think it's interesting that guys like you can do these kind of things, all of you, and kind of get these things out, but it is an uphill battle because you don't have, you know, the huge weight of like Hillary Clinton's team doing it. And mm -hmm. it's, it, there's so much, there's so much good stuff to read. It's easy to lose, you know, your guys' books in the, in the mix. Well, I you have a book. well, I have a funny story about that book. I didn't, so a dude, this was years ago, a guy came, he does a lot. He's written a lot of books. His name's Adam Slutsky. He's a really cool guy. And he was like, he wanted to do an improv improvised weapon book, like eh, from a green Bray's point of view. I said, yeah, I mean, I, he goes, I'll write it with you and da, 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 da. And we spent a lot of time on it. And I threw in a lot of sort of, I don't know, personal perceptions and vignettes and things that I thought would be, you know, interesting and funny. I wanted to name the book, the green Bray's guide to lazy street survival. Right. I'm, I thought that's a pretty funny title. And of course, if you put if you, if you put a seal on it, if when the seals write books, if they put the word seal in it, it's going to sell a million copies right away. So I was, was like, the first thing publishers ask me, yeah. very that, right. So I was like the Green Braze guy. So this publisher, <laughs> which is a small publisher, they didn't they fought me on it. They're like, no, we don't want to call it that because it seems like that's an official Green. I said it's not. An, I'm not. I'm not making a claim that I'm, you know, speaking for Swick down at, you know, Fort Bragg. I said, but by highlighting that I'm a special forces guy, and they, so they end up naming the book a guide to improvised weaponry. How boring is that? Like, that's boring, man. And then they didn't. A lot of stuff I wanted in there, they didn't put in. So it was kind of disappointing. Not from Adam, the guy who wrote it with me and, and kind of put it all together. I mean, he he put in. He did a lot of great work on it, but. It was disappointing in the publishing thing because I what what I wanted to do they just didn't really want to cooperate. And okay, so I got I got I got something very similar from um, it's called the Brass Knuckle Bible and it's about improvised weapons. This is from um, Fred Rexer, who was a Green Beret, and also John Milius' best friend. Uh, we talked about him. We talked about Red Dawn. That's right. That's right. We did talk. Yeah, yeah. This is this crazy. It's just like a pamphlet, but it, it's got all this, you know, like switchblades and like, you know, you know, like all kinds, you know, boot That's not very improvised. It's insane. Yeah, yeah like my book was more about things you wouldn't think <laughs> of as using handle. as a weapon and just, and just the mindset of like, you know, you don't, you're never really without a weapon if you don't think, if you think about it, right? You're kind of, there's always something within yeah. arm's reach of you and games you can play with your spouse and shit like that. It was pretty <laughs> funny, but. Everybody was, grab a weapon right now. Well, it's it's that it's that old adage of you know survival one hundred and one. You know, it's kind of like the first thing you think of is probably I got to get myself some force protection and then I got to find some water and some shelter. You know. Yeah, and then when yeah. Clay and when Clay came to me with his idea about what was going on and how people are really unprepared for this, um, you know, because guys, you know, we have a whole Twitter on Twitter. We have a whole group of guys that are really, really, really know their guns. Like I'm not a gun guy. Yeah, I use them as tools, and I was, you know blah, blah, blah. And I, I reckon I was good with what I used, but like, I'm not a gun guy, but like we have a lot of good weapons guys, but like it's a bigger picture than that. Like a country with guys who have guns isn't really going to stop you from getting taken over and destroyed. So like Clay's picture was a bigger picture of how to kind of incorporate that and to have like almost like a group of people that you can train with and rely on. And these guys are good for this. And these guys, Oh, that guy's a doctor. Oh, cool. That's great. This guy, this guy can fix cars. I mean, in a way, it was pretty subversive, right? I mean, especially yeah. since, you know, since the country, of course, since we're all white supremacists, right? And we're all, we all, we're all evil people. So I, I thought in a way it was kind of risky to talk about it, but Clay was very open about it and involving law enforcement, everything. It was just a ballsy thing to do. And, you know, I haven't talked to Clay in a while about it, but it was just the stuff's out there. But again, he had to do it all by himself, obviously. No, you know, no big publisher wanted to touch that, but it was, a, they were great books, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Can you I get that on Amazon? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. It's on Amazon. Yeah. All right, there you go. There you go. Is that Never Larry behind you? That's Larry on the couch over there. That's Larry on the couch, and then Molly's on the other couch, and Sweetie, the dog we got from the Korean meat factory a few mm -hmm. years ago. Wow. She's over wow. there. So that's crazy, man. Cult, like, I got all the kind of a freaking kettle here right now. <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> there's room for hope in some of this, though. If you look at like our mutual friend, uh, Jesse Kelly, just inked a new deal. He's got like 200 new stations or something. I'm, you know, some younger conservative people are starting to make moves that are that are big, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so, too. Well, I think so, too. And I think with, the best with Gina and like and Daily Wire and then also with I mean, lots of, of people on the right that are doing their own thing and crowdfunding is it's a lot less easier to get blacklisted if we have like our separate thing. That's you know? right. That's right. You're not relying on them. That's, that's what Cersei was saying is like, when you start relying on the big studios, then they own you no matter how good you are, no matter how great of an actor you are, right. These big A-list actors, they're still it, basically, they're still in debt to China. Right. Cause like, you know, what is it? John Cena, the other, when I was out yeah. in Arizona filming, like John Cena had to come out and apologize in Chinese because he mentioned that Taiwan is a country, right? I mean, like that just shows that I don't care how famous you are. Daniel Craig is still a slave to the Bond franchise, right? I mean, he still is. I mean, yeah. And so those are these are big heavy hitters in the background that just wield enormous amounts of power and money and. You still got to fight him, I guess. That Cena video was like a kid in an 80s movie standing out below some girl's window with a boom box. You know? <laughs> That's, That's right. right. That's right. That's <laughs> that was, right. dude, just, it, it's one thing, you know, we've obviously seen kind of like the apologists and whatnot, whether it's LeBron James or whomever, but I've never seen an American actor speak Mandarin and grovel like that before. I mean, it's like I said, we've seen actors grovel whether it's apologizing for their own personal behavior uh, or whatever, but the fact it that was it was kind of cool. It was kind of cool that he. It was kind of cool that he spoke Chinese. I was like, right on, dude. That's that's yeah. impressive, right? Because he learned in that re-education camp. <laughs> yeah, that's right, the subtitles. The fact, that, the fact that he was apologizing to China for saying that Taiwan would be the first country to see it, and they got mad at that. Damn, you know, dude. I'll, I'll, I'll give him this. The Mandarin will give him an edge in the gulags. That's that's for sure. <laughs> he'll you know, he'll he'll maybe have a nicer a nicer cell. Um, yeah. He'll get more rice. <laughs> you know, since we're talking about movies, I went back. Um,